please turn to Deuteronomy 11, Deuteronomy chapter 11. In this passage, Moses, he has reached, uh, near, he is nearing the end of his life. He had quite a walk. He had quite a relationship with God. The Lord considered Moses his friend, his friend. I want to look more carefully at the relationship with Moses and God by his last words that he's given. The Jews are about to enter the promised land. Moses, before he ends his life, before he dies on Mount Pisgah, and he can't go into the promised land with them, the Lord made sure, the Lord made sure that Moses had a chance to give final instructions. Deuteronomy is filled with so much wisdom, fresh review of a man's loving relationship with God a full mature experience after so many years. Deuteronomy chapter 11. The Bible says in verse 16, Take heed to yourselves, that your heart be not deceived. And he turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you. And he shut up the heaven that there be no rain, and that the land yield not her fruit, unless he perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord giveth you. Therefore shall he lay up these my words in your heart and in your soul and bind them for a sign upon your hand that they may be as frontlets between your eyes and ye shall te them, teach them your children speaking of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way when thou liest down and when thou risest up and thou shalt write them upon the doorposts of thine house and upon thy gates." that your days may be multiplied and the days of your children in the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give them as the days of heaven upon the earth. For if ye shall diligently keep all these commandments, which I command you to do them, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and to cleave unto him, then will the Lord drive out all these nations from before you and ye shall possess greater nations and mightier than yourselves." From all these commandments, these duties that the Jews are supposed to follow, Moses said that these are all done out of love. All of these have to be memorized, practiced as a part of their very own heart. He is afraid that their heart could be interfered and distracted by other gods or things in this world. So he urges all these Commandments, he refreshes all these commandments, these duties that the Jews are supposed to do to show their love for God. Normally, when a person is to give a whole list of commandments, it's not something that you can easily accept. It's not something that you could easily have an emotion to love, an emotion to feel. Especially if your parent is the one who's telling you all these commandments or instructions. And to be honest, they don't like to do it, but they know that they have to do it because they love their child, so they want to make sure that the child goes down the right path, makes the right decisions. So even if it's redundant, even if it's long, even if it's stressful, they will go through all the commandments or all the important uh, advice and instructions for the child to learn and to remember. When a child hears all of that, quite often it goes one ear and out the other because it feels like a heavy or a dry duty. It's not out of love, it's more so of duty. When we hear all the commandments and instructions from God on what we're supposed to do in our Christian life, the sad thing is that at the beginning, we all have a desire and a love to please the Lord. We have a desire and a love to please the Lord. So that's why we made a decision. You made a decision that no matter how long the list of commandments are or how hard the Christian walk might be, if that's what it costs to maintain your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, you are going to do it. You wouldn't be here today if you did not love the Lord. So you made that decision. 
You made that choice. However, you can't help as years go by, there are more things that you discover in your Christian walk that you have to do for the Lord. And instead of love, it feels more like duty. And then as time passes by, what you're used to loving, it now turns into work. And it's not like that you wanted to. Listen, it's something normal. A feeling can pass, a loving feeling can pass from this emotional sensation into actually obligation. That's an inevitable, realistic scenario that happens to all believers. And let me tell you something, that's okay. Let me tell you something, that's okay. You don't have to feel like that you came to church because you love to. I don't feel like coming to church today, right now I just feel so awful, had a lot of things going on earlier. But I do it anyway. And that is okay to do it out of duty rather than a feeling of love. A lot of times we might get discouraged. A lot of times you and I might ask ourselves, what's wrong with me? A lot of times we just hate our flesh and then we try to crucify the lust of the flesh, try to get ourselves into the love of Jesus Christ, and it feels like it's a struggle, not a natural thing to do. And we want to naturally love our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We want to love to come to church. We want to love the brethren. We want to love reading the Bible. We want to love praying. We want to love staying away from the world and being nearer to God instead. Just like we heard the special earlier. But it's not a natural feeling that we have and then we feel guilty and then we beat up ourselves and we wonder what's wrong with me. And let me tell you something, it's okay that when love turns into duty. I would like to talk to you about the power of love and for us to understand what real love is. Will you pray with me? Father, fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit and the cleansing of your blood and I pray that what I preach and teach will not be wrong, but truth, and it'll be a blessing to the hearers, and you'll be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Moses has received a lot of commandments and instructions, and we've seen that in just a portion in Deuteronomy. Did you read all of Deuteronomy? It's a lot more than that, the commandments. It's a lot more than that, the instructions. And quite often when we look at these five books of Moses, the majority is not the story. The majority are commandments, things that they're supposed to do. Their duties are listed, every detail. From these five books, how can one honestly call that love? How can one honestly say that I can easily do this because I love God so much, so this is a piece of cake and I'll do all these things for you, God? If we're going to be realistic, I don't care how spiritual you and I are, when you and I just read the book of Leviticus and Numbers, we feel dry. What about doing them? That'll be even more so. It'll feel more dry. It'll feel more like it's forced. It's an obligation rather than something natural that we love to do if we're going to be realistic about it. But I want to tell you that love is not a feeling. Love is action. I want you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians 13. Understand that love is not some kind of natural feeling, an emotional feeling, but more so your action, which is duty. Which is duty, the things that you do. Perhaps the greatest chapter about Christian love, the modern Bible versions We'll call it love, but God makes it something more specific, a key word that modern Bible versions neglected, and that is charity. Why, why is that crucial word needed? Why is that crucial word needed? Because love is not enough. 
Because then people will think that that's an emotional feeling. Charity means love in action. Love in action. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. This is not a natural feeling you have. Notice how these are actions in verse 4. Charity suffereth long. That's not an easy feeling. And is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. These aren't e easy feelings that come into you. These are things that you do. Verse 5, doth not behave itself unseemly. See that? It's what, how you behave. It's by your performance. It's by your actions. Seeketh not her own. Well, that, is that an easy feeling? Is that an easy feeling where... People think that love is something that I receive in return. A lot of times, no, it's instead a lot of times you give to that person and you don't receive it. So love is not that simple of a definition that you think of some kind of emotion that you feel because someone gives it to you. It's more of an action and a hard work and effort that you give to others. Notice in verse 5, is not easily provoked thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. How can one separate struggle from this? Work, effort, performance, duty. You can't. Notice right here that love is something that you do. Love is a duty. It's not some kind of emotional feeling. The danger of emotional feelings nowadays where people confuse that to be love is that's the reason why fornication is rampant, adultery is rampant, and then after that, then they easily divorce. Why? Because emotional feelings are fleeting. Feelings are fleeting. These aren't things that just stick in naturally to you and run 24-7 till the day you die. There is no such thing as that. No such thing as that. Love doesn't work or operate that way. It, coming to the real world, love is something that you'll have to perform, that you'll have to do to maintain the loving relationship. Not something that you have to constantly feel to maintain the relationship. Because if you always go by feeling and feeling, what's going to happen one day is that during that loving relationship, feelings will not only just flee away, but feelings might feel a little betrayed. Feelings will become tensed or strained because of the person or the object you love does not fulfill the emotion level that you feel. Not even the greatest drug will perform faithfully the greatest feeling that the drug addict will first feel after that first needle. See, love is not a feeling. Otherwise, you'll always feel like betrayed and your expectations of love will always be disappointment will always be let down. Such feelings are also uncontrollable. And those can be dangerous things, is that when you always go by love as some sort of a feeling, as some type of a high mode, then what happens is it's just something that just comes into you. There's no direct process or action or control in your part. Why is that dangerous? Because emotions that are not controlled by you, then one day, whatever random emotion you feel will continually control you. What, what's the dangerous thing behind that? What do you mean by that, Pastor? Well, Moses, let's go back through our main character here. Go to Exodus chapter 2 and Hebrews 11. Exodus chapter 2. And then we'll go to Hebrews Chapter 11. Moses, you might recall, is the one who told them about loving God. He had a good relationship with Jehovah. So he understands how that relationship works. 
So he also knew what it was like to have a feeling called love at the beginning before his ministry. He knew that it wasn't that good. In his mature years, he understood what love is. But before maturity, there's always immaturity. When you have love, it always begins as something immature, not mature. No one knows everything just like that and have perfect love like that. That's not how it works. Love is something that always starts out immaturely, as a feeling, as an emotion. And when those things happen, Moses went through something inevitable. Go to Hebrews chapter 11. Notice how we can plainly see that Moses, he was emotional. He had a passion. Love begins quite often with a passion. In, every, in most relationships, you start out with a p passion, a desire, a zeal. When you look at Hebrews chapter 11, the Bible says in verse 24, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Notice in his immature years, before his ministry, he went all out. He sacrificed Egypt to follow the Lord. Verse 25, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Moses, we can see right here, he wouldn't be able to give up all of Egypt and choose affliction with his people, choose to suffer for the name of God, unless there was a strong passion there to begin with, a strong love there. So there is no doubt about that. But see, such strong emotion he received and he had, but it was not controlled. And because he couldn't control that emotion, when he said, I'm going to sacrifice Egypt to suffer for the name of Jehovah, when he just went all out like that, which is good to have, and everyone should have that, and we should encourage people who have such emotions, but then again, we have to put some kind of control there. And if control is not put, like in Moses' case right here, I'm going to go against Egypt. I'm going to suffer for God, then such emotions make him go down to where the Jews are and then see his people afflicted and enslaved when he shouldn't be there. And then he sees some Egyptian beating up his brother and then he commits a sin, not a good work, but a sin called murder. Why? Because of his emotional feeling where he had a passion to go against Egypt and stand up for Jehovah. Look at Exodus chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2. The Bible says in verse 11, And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, that he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens. See that? He chose affliction with his people. I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. I choose to suffer for the name of Christ. Great, wonderful. But then specifically what happened when he decided that? He went down there, the Bible says, and looked on their burdens, and he spied an Egyptian. He spied? What does spy mean? That means he shouldn't be there. He went into a place that he shouldn't be in to look at something. An Egyptian smiting in Hebrew, one of his brethren, and looked this way and that way. And when he saw there was no man, if he was doing what's right, why would he look around like that? If he's doing the good work of the Lord, why is he looking this way and that way? Why is he having second thoughts? Why is there some fear, guilty emotion if he, should follow, if he should boldly follow the Lord? He slew the Egyptian, so he committed murder. There's nothing right about that. It's all wrong. Why? Because of an emotional feeling. An emotional feeling that was not controlled. 
When you get married in a loving relationship, you thought that you found the one that you love. And you're like, this person is it, just matches everything that I want and I desire. This is the one that God designed for me. And we're going to be together for life. I'm going to sacrifice and give up everything I have for this person that I love. And I could get objections and cries from people all around me. But it doesn't matter if I really love this person that much. Nothing is going to stop me and I choose this person that I love and suffer anything and everything. Sacrifice what I have for this person that I love. And you know, when you're dating that person and then when you're going through your honeymoon years, that's all you see is uh, the love with that person spouse and then feelings just feel like it's flying midair and you're like this is the greatest thing that ever happened in my life it's something you never felt before you tried out the world you tried out sin before as a believer but this man called Jesus was a different feeling wasn't it such a different feeling you never saw this before how people just love the Lord during him singing you never felt this before when you heard the preaching of the Word of God speaking to you. You never saw it before how God answered prayers and how God did miracles in your life and nothing of this world could ever match up with that. Oh, this man called Jesus is someone that you just fell in love with, wasn't it? No other person you're willing to sacrifice and give up everything for a being. But then what happens is when you hit a couple years into marriage, then it's like those emotions that you had such, wow, you met my expectations, you exceeded my expectations. It becomes strain, doesn't it? And then there were things that you saw in that person you loved you didn't see before when you were dating. You didn't see before when you first met the person. There were differences. And that your expectation level kind of lowered, didn't it? And then when it lowered, then it became even lower when you saw differences you did not like that really hurt your expectation. And you're like, if you really loved me, you wouldn't do that to me. You would not go against my expectation. You would fulfill my expectation that day. And how many times have you heard the spouse say? How many times have you heard yourself say, remember back then when we first dated, you said this to me and you did this for me and then all of a sudden you're not that person that I first met. What happened to you? And then you go through disagreements, it turns to fights, it turns to losing testimony, and if it gets more ugly, it turns into distance, yeah. then it turns into separation, and God forbid you become one of those 50% in America who write out a divorce, looking for another feeling to fulfill, another love to find that would meet up your expectation. That's what love does when you picture love as a feeling. Okay. There it is. But with duty, Come on. what happens is I, I made a promise I would die with you. That you are the only one for me. That there's not, nobody else. And that through sickness and in health and through trial and sadness... I will be there with you. So it doesn't matter when I have these negative feelings in my emotion and that I don't have the positive feeling of love in my heart. When we go through sadness, when we go through tension, when we go through strain, I am obligated to you. This is what bound me to you. And because this bound me to you, I am obligated obligated and it is my duty to stay with you no matter how much I don't like it. Why? Because I chose you. And I will live with you and I will die with you. So 
when we go through problems together, let's deal with those problems. Let's bear all things, endure all things. <coughs> but it's not all negative. Through that enduring all things, let us hope all things. Let us believe in all things that we got a great God who will take care of us. That's what charity is in 1 Corinthians 13. We endure all things, we pair all things, we believe all things, and we hope in all things. And that's love out of obligation, that's good. out of duty. And that's okay when that happens. If you don't feel loving, if you don't feel like you love to serve the Lord, if you don't feel like you love Jesus Christ like you used to love Him, and you don't love Him singing like, like you used to love Him singing, you don't love Bible reading like you used to love Bible reading, you don't love being a Bible believer like you used to love being a Bible believer, you love sacrificing, serving God all the way, you don't have that feeling like before. And then the flesh comes in, the world comes in. That just interferes all the time. That's okay. Just keep coming to church. Just keep reading your Bible. Just keep serving Him. Just keep staying away from the world. Just keep performing your duty, not feeling. That's what the Christian life is. That's what real relationship, real love is is that it's performed out of action. Let's go to Revelation 2, Revelation 2. But pastor, that can be a dangerous thing. Didn't God warn that if you constantly do these things just out of duty, just because you have to, then you can leave your first love? You know what? You're right. Actually, the Bible does warn about that. And you're right that you do things out of duty rather than love, then it's going to be dangerous. Let's first read Revelation 2 and let me clarify. Revelation chapter 2. The Bible says in verse 2, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars and has borne, and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored, and has not fainted. Duty, duty, duty. See all that? Work, work, work. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. You're right. If you do all these things just because you have to, then the dangerous thing is that first love you have for Jesus Christ will be gone, and then marriage will be something that you live in a life of, listen, misery, not love. And you don't want to live the next 20, 30 years until the day you die in misery rather than love. So then, pastor, we got a problem right here, do we not? Well... If you're feeling like that, that it's miserable, and let's just be realistic. It's just miserable to come to church, miserable to serve God, miserable to read the Bible, pray, miserable to stay away from sin. This miserable feeling that I don't even understand, but I just feel it today without any explanation. That happens in the Christian walk and Christian relationship. And those things happen, and yet you come to church, you read the Bible and pray, and that can be a very dangerous thing so then what do you do about it how does that reconcile with what you said earlier pastor about duty about obligation it actually reconciles it does what it does it it combines with it it takes it the duty takes that first love you don't get rid of duty First love is never rid of. First love goes through a metamorphosis process. First love matures. See, if you look at the verse right here, the verse says, because thou hast left thy what? First love. Okay, it's this first love. This first love, though, is combining with the works with the duty. 
because keep reading verse 5. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the what? Wait, it said first works. Matching with first love. When God told them, God never told them right here that uh, feel your first love. You don't see that anywhere in that verse. You know what it says? Do, do, do. Not feel, not feel, but do what? The first work. Struggle, effort, duty. And that equals, that is into the first love. If God was condemning their duty, their works, and you weren't reading the scriptures, he never did. If you look at verse 2 and verse 3, those works that they did were never condemned. Right. He approved of them. Yes. He says, good job. You're reading the Bible. Good job you're praying. Good job that you're trying to help out the brethren. Good job that you're trying to maintain your relationship with me. He never told them to get rid of those things. The only issue he had is, hey, you got to put your first love in there. You got to keep doing those works, but combine it with your first love. Well, how am I supposed to do that? That verse says, look back at that verse. Look back at that verse. It'll show you how you can do that. If you go back to that verse, it says the most important word at verse 5, remember Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and then you do the first works. See, you just have to recall, if you want to maintain your relationship with that spouse, and you made a promise when you married that spouse, I'm going to go through death and everything with you, and as you're going through misery, as you're going through problems and tensions and expectations are let down, you just have to remember what you loved about him or her. You have to remember what is it that drew your love to that person? What made you decide on that person? What made that person attractable to you? See, if you were to recall that, then what happens is when that's combined with what you're currently doing your duty for that person, then that's real love. Yeah, yeah. Immature love is something where I just have to feel something. You have to do something for me to make me have this feeling again so that I can properly love you is a mature immature love it is a selfish love and it is a self-centered love and it is a love that has no obligation or duty so you know what you need to do when you come to church today and you don't feel it remember how God brought you to this church you forgot that okay. how God showed you Bible believing truth Remember all those people who are dying and going to hell? Look at all those people in those false churches right now, and you're one of the out of 1,000, one out of 10,000, one out of 100,000 in this whole Bay Area that is in the right church. And when you're like, I don't want to come to church today, remember that. And when sin starts to appeal in front of your eyes and the world has something better out there and you're like, man, I, if only I would do those things. But because of my Christian duty, I can't get my life any better. Stop looking at better homes, better families, better jobs and better lifestyles out there. You need to remember the calling that you got, how you got it. The services that you're doing for the Lord. You never thought you'd grew this much, haven't you, in your spiritual growth? You'd accomplished this much for the Lord already, haven't you? Recall the gold, silver, precious stones. Recall that determination. Did you forget that 
altar call that you had with God after you heard the preaching of the Word of God where the preacher preached about commitment, sacrificing the world, taking up your cross, and following Jesus Christ, that something stirred in your heart and you had a love for Jesus Christ and a hatred for the world, and you say, God, uh, I give up the world. I put it behind me. I don't care what its glamour will do to me. I've decided to follow Jesus. I surrender. I repent. You are the one that I choose out of my life and I'll suffer anything for you. Remember that? Remember that? Okay, you forgot on. that, didn't you? That's good. Preach right there. Because you got lost in your duty. Mm -hmm. You just need to remember that. That's good. And then keep performing your duty of suffering for Jesus Christ. Of the world making fun of you. Let the world keep flashing its glamour and tempt you. Let them do it all day long for all you care because you remember vividly what you said to that world when it showed off to you. No, no, no. I gave you up a long time ago. I sacrificed you a long time ago. I gave it up. I decided to follow Jesus. Amen. So you just need to remember that and then combine it with your duty. There's nothing wrong with duty. God approved of what you did. God approved of what you're doing for him. It's a normal thing to do. But you just need to remember why you're doing it. When I go to my relationship with the one that I love... And then things happen, tensions happen in the relationship. And then things that could just break apart our relationship just seem stronger and stronger. My memory and my remembrance has to be stronger and stronger on things that I loved about that person. Things that made that person lovely to me. Things that I desired about that person. Things that, what are the odds of me having this person? Things that I... Loved and I just recalled to memory. And then when I combine that with my duty to the person I love, I go one on one with that person. And then I take it out and then I write where I fell out of my first love. And I say, the reason why I forgot my love for you is because I had an expectation, a false expectation of you on this. I write down the next one. It's because of things that came into my life. Busyness. I mark that down. It's because of things where I lacked patience that I should put more patience into. And I write those things down. Why? So I don't forget. It's always in the memory and the void of forgetfulness you will lose your first love very easily. But when those things are called up to remembrance in your mind, and there are times that uh, this does happen with me and my wife, sometimes we'll remind each other daily. We'll write things down together. You might say, well, uh, I don't do that. Well, God bless you. You must have a better relationship uh, than me. But I write them down. Why? So that she and I can see the things that will interfere with our love that we have to watch out for and the things that we need to do to rekindle our love for one another. Why? Because we forget them in the void, in the void of many years living together. So I write them down. And make a deal. Because Moses did the same thing when he fell out of his relationship with God. He had to write them down. Look at Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32. Here are commandments made out of love. And God wanted them to love him. Written by the finger of God. Man. Man. Sacred, holy stuff. God gave it to Moses. <laughs> what love, man. His first writing, God's first writing on a tables of stone given to Moses and Moses broke that relationship. 
Why? Because he had an emotional problem. Again, he didn't control his emotional problem. And his emotions destroyed. It was in danger of breaking his relationship. Notice right here that the Bible says in Exodus chapter 32. And then the Bible says, notice what Moses did, which is very, very sad. In verse 15, and Moses turned and went down from the mount, and the two tables of the testimony were in his hand. Verse 16, and the tables were the work of God. Wow, what a loving thing to have. And then verse 19, and it came to pass as soon as he came nigh unto the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the tables out of his hands and break them. Break them. You broke your relationship with God. You remember those times you broke it? Hey, come on, there's a breaking point with your walk with God. It's not a perfect slate. There's a breaking point with someone that you love. It's not a perfect slate. So then what do you do? Oh, I got to find the next fleeting emotion of love somewhere. Really? Good luck. You'll never find it. You'll never feel it. You know what you do? Go to chapter 34. Chapter 34. Verse 4. Chapter 34, verse 4. You know what you need to do? You need to repent and do it again. You need to have one person doing his part and you doing your part to protect that loving relationship and keep it stable. Exodus 34, verse 4. And he hewed, see Moses out of his part, hewed two tables of stone like unto the first. I left my first love. I forgot my first work. I broke it. Let me do it again. Verse 4, and Moses rose up early in the morning, went up into Mount Sinai, as the Lord had commanded him. And he took in his hand the two tables of stone. And notice that God said at verse 1, verse 1, and the Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first. See, do your first work that you did before that you broke. And thank God, I will write upon these tables. Not you, Moses, I will write upon these tablets. Tables, the words that were in the first tables which thou breakest. God said, I'll do my part. You do your part, I'll do my part. And that's how a loving relationship is maintained is that you do your part, and God will do his part. You know how a loving relationship is not maintained? Lord, you do it all for me. Lord, why did this thing happen to me? Lord, that is so unfair. Lord, you ought to do more for me. My life is so pitiful. Oh, I, got a be I deserve better things. And See, you're not doing anything about it yourself. It's all like, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. You know what you need to do? You give to him. You do something about it. You restore your relationship with Jesus Christ. You got to remember what you broke. You got to remember your first works, your first love that you broke. You need to remember that and then repent. And guess what? God will write it out for you. It's that simple. It's that simple. And he, when he writes it out for you, let me tell you something. Don't lose it again. Okay, there you go. Because thou hast left thy first love. Don't break it again. But I tell, I'll tell you something. You did leave it. You did break it because it's lost in the forgetful void of many years of your relationship. You left it in the void. It's long gone and you've forgotten it. You need to bind them in your heart, write them out, do something about it where you can maintain it so that you don't lose it in the void of forgetfulness. You know what Moses said at Deuteronomy 11? Did you forget that one? He said, uh, I'll remind you again in Deuteronomy 11 when God gave the commandments, 
he said in verse 18 therefore shall he lay up these my words in your heart and in your soul and bind them for a sign upon your hand that they may be as frontlets between your eyes why because that's how stupid you and I are and we will forget in the lost void of busyness in the lost void of suffering in the lost void of false expectations in the lost void of just simply time itself many men, much time passing by it's so simple it's simple just remember your first love remember where you fell come before the Lord let him write out something to you and don't lose it that's what altar call is for that's why altar call is there every Sunday why you forget all the stinking time you know one thing I like about Deuteronomy chapter 11 is that when Moses gave that statement they're going to be words in your heart and you're gonna bind them and they're gonna be like frontlets in your eyes it's very interesting now this is just my opinion and I could be wrong but I believe most of what is written in Deuteronomy was actually simply that became a part of his heart from memory now remember Moses is over a hundred years old but he didn't forget it it became a part of him he was able to speak it all to the Jews if you read all of Deuteronomy that's a lot of commandments right it's a lot of ridiculous stuff and details that you and I would forget very easily but Moses did not how do you know that pastor because the reason why I believe that Moses he had that memorized is if you keep reading on he says the very next verse verse 19 verse 19 and he shall teach them your children what speaking of them and thou sittest in thine house yeah. speak <laughs> so it's something that should have been in their heart that they could by instinct just speak it out as a matter of fact if you look at chapter 9 verse 1 chapter 9 verse 1 Moses wasn't writing all this he says here or oh, oh Israel see that what's going on he's speaking to them yeah. it's something he knows by instinct Moses knows by instinct all these duties what he's supposed to do all these duties which made him understand God's personality traits he told them about God's personality traits he'll he'll have wrath on you he'll be jealous he'll show you goodness right here if you do this for him only a man whose loving relationship has gotten so deep and so long into that would understand by instinct what his lover would want and he doesn't actually need to be really reminded of that when you love someone so much and then your passion is gone it flees so then you're just doing these things you're just being dutiful you're doing your duty and then you don't have that feeling of love and that gets to you but that's okay you just remind yourself you work on those issues that is interfering with your love as you keep performing your duty and you say this is where I fell this is what I need to remember and this is what I need to handle and deal with and this is something that I mark it down I write it down where I don't forget and I'm going to do my part I'm going to do extra duty on this one and then as you keep doing this this is how your relationship feels like it's not this it's
But then given enough time, and then when you hit like 70, perhaps, you just, you just don't think about duty. It doesn't come into your mind. It's just something that's a part of instinct. Something that's a part of your life and you just keep doing it because this is who you are. And it's not like that when you go out on a date with your lover and then you have a meal that you have to do the same thing like you did back then the first time you met that person and showing off your love and then trying to wow him or her or woo him or her and then you, know, you have to express emotion because it's not an emotional thing this love. This love is more controlled. The emotion is more controlled. Because you've done it so many times from duty that it became a part of you and then it's now a natural thing and by the time when that lover of yours dies and passes away it's like a piece of you is gone. And you realize, wow, I was very attached to that person. I really love that person more than I thought. And that is love in maturity. That's good. Amen. See, uh, when you are street preaching, it comes out with a strong passion and desire. Man, I, I, I need to get souls saved. I need to do this for the Lord. I, I want to see what it's like. And man, this is good stuff. I'm preaching the gospel on the streets. And even though the world is criticizing me, make fun of me, I got a passion for God. And then as years pass by, it's just something where you drag your flesh over. You go through traffic. And then you have to do it because it's your duty. So then you get on yourself when you're driving to street preaching. What's the matter with you? Why are you feeling miserable? Why are you feeling down? Why is it you don't love it? Lord, I remember where I fell. And I can see that because of traffic, because of my tiredness, that's what's causing me not to love street preaching. Will you forgive me? And will you... Do something for me in return. Write, a, write it on my heart. And then here you are. You do your street preaching, not because you feel it, but because it's a duty. And you're struggling to maintain the love. Yeah. And then the next day of street preaching, it's not like you love street preaching. It's again, Lord, forgive me. I remember where I fell. That thing is happening to me again. Lord, uh, right upon the table, my heart. And the love is not natural. It's a struggle. It's a duty. It's a work. And then week three, and then week four, and week five, and month three, and month four, and then month seven, and eight, Year one and year two and just goes on and on the never-ending story. But then all of a sudden you just lose track of time now. You don't think about it much anymore. It's like it's something you accepted. And then when years pass by, it just comes out of instinct. Wake up in the morning, read the Bible, pray. Instinct. Come to church instinct there's something in the volunteer sheet i'm going to sign up for instinct i see a brother and sister in need i'm going to pray for them i'm going to help them i'm going to fellowship with them instinct no don't look at that don't touch that don't taste that stay away from that world keep a distance instinct 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 cuss word doesn't become tempting it's repulsive Worldly music is not tempting. It makes you angry. And then instinct, 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 instinct. And then all of a sudden, after living 70 years of your life, struggling to maintain your love and your relationship with Jesus Christ, you can't divorce from that. It's like, this is all I ever lived. This is all I know. This is all I do. And I remember what it was like back in the world, my own ways. This is for real what I got. 
I can't divorce from this. Amen. And it's a mature love because now you know it all. You experienced it. You accepted it. It's now something you control. Wow. That's good. And you don't let passion override you again. You don't let feelings control your life again. Amen. You got it under control now. I can love you because I want to and I got it under control. I can choose to love you rather than feeling something and then I'll love you. No, no more, God. I don't have to feel something. I got it under control now. I'm used to it. I choose to love you. I'll do this work for you. Something that became instinct now. Instinct to stay faithful to your lover Instinct to not let distractions and temptations interfere with your love for your lover. Complete instinct to never skip out, put a gap on your time of dating and spending time with your lover. And if that lover wants you to wash the dishes, go to church. If that lover wants you to give extra money to him or her to buy a gift or to put a little extra on the offering plate. If that lover asks you and your duty to that lover day in and day out is to do all these functions for that person, it is faithful, it is committed, it is not skipped, it is not neglected, there is no gap there, it just becomes instinct. You just wake up in the morning and serve God. It's instinct. Stay away from the world. Instinct. You suffer for him. Instinct. Instinct. You got, you got something like that? You feel something like that? Don't you want something like that? Imagine coming to church because you want to. Just instinct. And nothing interferes. Nothing interferes with your Bible reading the prayer. No sin, no great temptation, no matter how alluring it is, will get you away from Jesus Christ. Imagine that kind of a love. Man, what a love. Don't you want that kind of a love? You want that? Then do your duty. Duty. You don't have to feel something to serve God. Just do it. Just do your duty. You know, when we go to the last chapter in Deuteronomy, <clears throat> last chapter in Deuteronomy, I like the wording of this verse. <coughs> Moses... I can describe his relationship and all summarized as follows <clears throat> in verse 5, Deuteronomy 34, 5. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab according to the word of the Lord. And verse 7, and Moses was 100 years old, 120 years old when he died. Now look at this. His eye was not dim, nor his what? Natural force abated. I like that. No matter how old he was, can you picture that, how old he was? That's a lot of problems. You can get weaker. You can't perform the things that you used to do before. Which should mean then, listen to me, which should mean Moses can't do the things for the Lord like he used to do. If he gets older, right? But notice right here in this verse, it never wavered. He kept doing the things that he can do for the Lord. He had a natural force that never abated. You know, when you serve the Lord, you want to do it out of love, right? But duty just keeps interfering. And when duty comes in, that means you force yourself. It doesn't mean you naturally do it out of love. Well, let me tell you something. You should force yourself. Now, hear me out right here is that 
Some people will say, well, if you force to do things in your life that you don't want to do, then you're going to be miserable and that's not healthy. True, but even psychologists who say that, they will admit that if there is something that you want to do, you have to force it first. And when you force it at the first few minutes on something you want to do, but it's a struggle, what happens is then naturally, eventually, you love to do it. You know, that verse never said unnatural force. His unnatural force abated. What did the verse say? His what? Natural force. He forced himself, but it's something he can naturally do. Isn't that an encouragement, what God promised you? There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not what? Suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. What does that mean? What you're naturally apt to do for him, what you're naturally apt to conquer the temptation, naturally apt to suffer for him, naturally apt to do great things for him, he's not going to give you something beyond that. It'll be something you naturally do. If that is a promise from 1 Corinthians 10, 13, why does it feel like then that, why does it feel like then that when we go through temptation, oh, it's not my natural ability. I'm just too weak. I can't handle it. I'll tell you why, because you didn't force yourself. See, that's why. You need to put some force there that can make it natural to you. You need to force it. Temptation is not something, serving Jesus Christ is not something that just comes, some force comes inside you, let the force be with you, and then you're like, Aah! and then you just do it. No, no, no. What, you need, what that force is, is you do the force. You force yourself and then let that natural thing kick into you. Man, I love Jesus Christ. I love serving him. That's how I naturally feel. I love to preach at you. But before I preached on this pulpit, I did not want to preach at you. But see, I forced myself to come up on this pulpit. I forced myself and racked my brain to prepare the message. I forced myself to preach to you and yield to the power of God and give it to you. And then naturally the love of Jesus Christ just flooded my soul and I love preaching at you. Yes. You don't like Bible reading and prayer, then force yourself. Amen. And then while you're praying, you can feel that naturally come to you and you're like, man, it's... Man, this is great. I'm talking to God and I'm getting through my prayer. And then, and then you, when you read your Bible, it's like, oh, I'm reading through Chronicles. And then you just force yourself. And after just reading and reading and reading, then you're like, man, I just accomplished three chapters of the Bible. I let God speak to me. I feel spiritual sustenance now that can pull me through the day. And then when you wake up in that morning and you forced yourself to Bible read and prayer, naturally you are happy that you did that. And then when you get up and then you're like, okay, now it's time to go to church. But then that flesh says, oh, you've done enough work for the Lord, haven't you? And oh, aren't you tired? And you're sick and you're just going through hard times and you're just so busy. You just don't have time. And then I just force myself to put on my tie and my suit and take my King James Bible. And then if I have to drink coffee, I'll have to do it drag myself to my car and then just force myself to drive force and force and then get inside the church and then naturally I'm like wow after two hours of preaching man I'm glad I heard the preaching of the word of God and then uh, when you see brothers and sisters in Christ and you're like man oh, oh man I got a fellowship, I got a love, but I just want to be by myself. I just want to do my own thing. I want to go back home. I'm tired. I got things to do. You just force yourself to line up over there and eat the food. Force yourself to talk with people. Force yourself to go to a brother and sister in Christ and to just be there for it. You just force yourself and then while you're doing that, you're like, man, I'm having a good time. Yes. 
Man, I received something from my brother and sister in Christ. Man, I'm so glad I have a spiritual family. I didn't realize that before because I was just all, spend time all alone. And then when you go back home and then you take the preaching of the word of God and then temptation's repeating again, sin is repeating again, and you're all by yourself in home and then... What you do is you just force the preaching of the word of God of what you heard today and force it and force it and you don't yield to temptation. You don't yield to sin. You don't repeat the same cycle of wasting your whole day again in your flesh and in the worldly system. You force yourself to do something for God and to stay away from sin and you just force it and force it and then... By the end of the night, when you go to bed, you're like, man, wow, I feel like I accomplished something. I got a victory. Wow, it's good to stay clean. Wow, I just imagine this day where I did not sin. Now, of course, we all still sin, but just not like doing that much sin, huh? And like, man, I accomplished more good than harm. Man, this feels great. And then the next day comes and then temptation and the flesh repeats again. Wow, you know, you're just, uh, we're going to never leave you alone and we're just going to keep bothering you. Man, it's a miserable life, isn't it? Because we're going to be bothering you. You force yourself to resist the flesh and the world again and you force and you force and you force. And by the time you reach the end of the day, you're like, man, I'm so happy. Man, I accomplished something for the Lord. And then Tuesday comes Come and it repeats again. And then you force and you force and force and force. And by the end of the day, you're like, yeah. it's so natural to you that uh, isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? Amen. It's just natural to you that, man, I've decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. It's so natural to you to enjoy holiness more than sin. Okay. It's just so natural. And then the next day comes again and then, oh, you feel heavy and nothing wants to force you. And then you force and you just push. You kick yourself. You push yourself. You beat yourself and you say, keep going, keep going. Huff, puff, force, force, force. Then you go from Wednesday to Thursday. You force yourself on Friday. You force yourself Saturday. Then you force yourself on Sunday. And then Sunday gives you something. Then you force yourself Monday. Then you force it on week three. You force it on week five. You you force it on week nine. You force it to 52 weeks and you don't really have to make a New Year's resolution by the end of the year. And then the next year comes and you force yourself on year 2024. You force yourself on year 2025. Bless God, you force it on year 2026, 2027, and then God knows when. And when you die and go to heaven or when the rapture hits, you force yourself till the rapture and bless God at the judgment seat of Christ, you're just naturally happy, shouting, rejoicing, and saying, I accomplished this, God! <laughs> now, force yourself on this altar. Force yourself when you go back home. And force yourself till Jesus comes again. Put a force into it. Then something natural will happen to you. Every head bow and every eye shut.